Hey everyone, welcome to episode 73 of the Bonehead Podcast, where we talk all things Blood Bowl. Welcome back, I'm Ben, and once again I'm joined by Blood Tithe Ben. Hello, hello. How are you doing, BT? Yeah, really good. Um, trying to make it through this heat. Uh, I've got <laughs> a setup here with a fan that's hopefully not causing too much problem with background noise, um, but that's blasting on me. Otherwise, I'm going to turn into juice. And yeah, other than that, I'm just trying to make it through this podcast. <laughs> Under the heat. If I collapse <laughs> by the end of it, that's the heat, not 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 because I'm bored. <laughs> uh, no, that's cool. So talking of uh, glad to be here, we were also joined by Ian Triplo today. Um <laughs> How you doing, Trips? Uh, I'm I'm good, thanks. Thanks, Ben's. I'm having a lovely week off, so we're enjoying the sun. Thank you, uh, weather, for picking a good week to, oh, for me. You have picked a heck of a week to have off. Like being in the office yeah. this week has been um, significantly challenging. Unfortunately, Lily, my assistant, is on maternity leave, and she left her pregnancy fan in my office, so it's just been permanently set up. Uh, which has been an absolute godsend. Wow. Um, I know, really, really, really useful. However, it is not in the studio, and uh, the lights are in the studio, and being upstairs, so is all the heat. Anyway, we are also, also joined by a whole bunch of our Patreons today, because this is going to be one of our live streams. So, guys in chat, thank you very much for joining us. Pop us questions as we go along, um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be a good one today. So, Ben, what are we talking about on episode 73? Uh, on this episode, we're going to be talking about uh, some tournaments that are coming up, first of all. Um, we're also going to be having a little bit of a round-robin chat about 3D printing. Um, we have Ian, who's a 3D printing pro in our club, um, and so it's, it'll be really good to have our, our own discussions on that. We're also going to be having a little chat about star players as well, which is related to an upcoming tournament. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, star players are absolutely um, hot. And if you are a part, if you're on Twitter or in the Facebook um, Blood Bowl community, uh, you're seeing a lot of tournament results come back and there's a lot of star players in them. Uh, there was one in particular that triggered a whole bunch of people and we'll mention that a little bit later. But we haven't had releases for Games Workshop for a little while, so it made sense to figure out how to get our own releases and the best way to do that is to print them yourself. So yeah, we've dragged our 3D printing uh, correspondent, Ian, on here. Uh, also bonehead bowl survivor uh so we can have a bit of a round robin and chat about that and hopefully answer some questions from uh, some of the guys in patreon as well so let's bounce straight into news okay so news wise this week in the blood bowl world Games Workshop did drop some rules in White Dwarf 466. Now, we briefly talked about this last episode, Ben, didn't we? But have you guys had a chance to look through and properly digest the the rules that the Games Workshop blessed us with when it comes to referees? I haven't picked up the magazine myself, um, but I have seen um, the rules. Uh, we had a... We will post them in our group. Ah, uh, there we go. Ian's come prepared. He's got the magazine with him. <laughs> I, I, I have a few words to say on this, but let's start. Um, let's, Ian, what do you think? Well, f well firstly, I, I haven't managed to snip the card out of the uh, magazine yet. You always get really nervous at that point of uh, trashing the whole thing, and it'd just be nice if they were uh, uh, in, in the magazine as a dropout, I think would be the nice thing. I think yeah my, my initial read of the rules is they're going to be the kind of thing that people never really get around to using unless they specifically want to there doesn't seem to be a lot of added benefit to have them there other than going what what were those models for i agree completely yeah i think it, it feels like something that could have definitely been in death zone especially as the um it is crazy the, the that it wasn't in death zone <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a proper like segment of rules that is very entirely optional. Which that book is, we 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 praised it for being entirely optional. Um, it is just bizarre they kind of provide the models and then the rules for, to use them um, is in like the White Dwarf. I think that was a bit of an odd decision, and I think you're absolutely right. Ian. I think a combination of the rules being kind of a little bit 
a little bit janky, um, not hugely impactful, and the fact they're only in the magazine, I think it will be quite rare that we see these on the pitch. I I agree. I don't think that people will use these very often, but I think this very much like the old special play cards and stuff. Um, you know, we always we we us guys we tend to think of Blood Bowl as a competitive or as league, right? We 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 go kind of like the grindy RPG route or the Magic the Gathering, build your deck, try it out over three or four games again. But I think there's a chunk of the Blood Bowl community that are mm. kitchen table players, you know. And stuff like the yeah. special play rules, the balls, the stadiums, and these referees, for those people who are just playing to play a fun game, I think this is awesome, and I do think it adds a load of narrative to it. Like, the way the referees go, I know we talked last week, Ben, and you were like, ugh, ball and chain every turn, you know, it can be a bit tricky. And when the elf is moving six squares a turn, yeah, maybe that's right. Yeah. But... I don't know. I think it's a very cool thing. Imagine an orc, a goblin and a dwarf team playing each other. The dwarfs have the death roller. You know, goblins have all the secret weapons. And the first thing they do is take out the referee. Now, those secret weapons don't get sent off for the rest of the game. Everything goes to hell. Everybody's fouling everybody. I don't know. I just think that is a game you remember. And just the hilarity of being like, right, Lord Borak or the Minotaur just chasing the referee around the pitch to get a massive blitz on yeah. him and kill him. I just, it's just super, super Blood Bowl. Um, I, I, I agree completely. I think it's a really, like, uh, while I say these these will be rarely seen, I am really keen to use them because I think I may elect to offer with the opponent a revised movement rule just to speed things up. But in terms of the gameplay elements where it's like you can perform fouls out of like line of sight and stuff like that, I think that's really, really quite cool and super thematic. Um, so, I, yeah, like you say, I love them. Just think it's a little bit weirdly introduced. It is weirdly introduced, but hey, this, I guess, counts as Blood Bowl stuff being released. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is it is getting a little bit like 40k OS where there's like seven different documents every month. The monthly meta is like, it's now on two slides and here's all the optional rules and there's this referee trying to compile it all so that anybody coming into Blood Bowl can be like, right now, what now, when, who, where? Here's a list of all the yeah. stuff that's going on. That's why it's so important because I knew this would happen. Um, but like, if i think ben you you called it like once every now and again this would be useful so i think we we tried to start filming the new youtube series but had tech issues so ended up just playing out game but first round maybe vanilla then one of the rounds we have the referee in and another round we have a giant in or something and we just try out some of these special rules one at a time just to get them on the pitch yeah. and to, to really try them i mean trips can you see these rules being used in a in a league match at club night uh, i can see see someone doing it for fun i can't see people choosing to do it just because it will slow the game down a bit yeah. particularly for a, for a club night i think i could see for playoffs or important games it might actually be quite fun because it might change the dynamics a little bit um what i really hope is that this isn't the last of the refs and there's actually going to be some other ref models or some other special refs out there that will tweak it and give us a bit more fun to play with it because i think that could be really cool if you you get to the stage of it's it's a certain race ref that you really don't want to draw yeah actually that's a really cool idea um yeah i mean we there are some models for the different refs there are third party models for all the different refs so we've got like a whole bunch of other races that we've got yet to see um, sounds like an opportunity to do a bonehead competition at some point, Ben. Um, I know we've kind oh, of that got like, yeah, yeah, ref bowl. <laughs> yeah, we kind of, yeah. I know we've got a couple of things lined up ready for next month, but we might have to might have to shuffle them around a little bit to to get brewing on referee ideas. Um, no, brilliant. So we had the ref rules. Um, anything in the chat for the refs? It doesn't look like, which is fine. Just a little bit about. Um, wouldn't it be great if Games Workshop actually posted a YouTube tutorial rather than just hide the rules in White Dwarf? I think Ooh, yeah. if, the, if the rules were more accessible, that would be great. I suspect that's an almanac -ish at the at Christmas time that we all end up buying, so we've only got one book instead of four books. Yeah, It's a bit extreme, isn't it? It's, the game hasn't been out a year, and we've already got five different books of rules for Blood Bowl, if you include two spikes of White Dwarf. 
and two rule books. <laughs> two spikes, death zone, two white dwarfs because you've got acorn in one of them as well. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, and death zone. Yeah, the pile gets bigger. However, I just keep buying it on digital, and and I love it. I think it's brilliant. Um, and you know, you don't have to wait for postage. It is cool to have a, a magazine, and especially because this white dwarf, Ian Warhanam Hannam, actually made it into the white dwarf as well. He which did. is pretty cool. Yeah. One of his orc models made it in there. Um, so he was, uh, uh-huh. yeah, he was very excited and then we ruined his fun. I can't remember how, but I think I may have been responsible for that. Um, but yeah, so Blood Bowl news. We got this Kickstarter front. The Vortis Stadiums one is wrapping up right about now. Um, if you search fantasy football on Indiegogo, there's a very creepy one that has nothing to do with Blood Bowl. I recommend you don't click it. Um and that was that was not what i was expecting it was uh yeah weird yeah, so that, so like shining advert for that now i think people wouldn't have gone if... <laughs> i've warned them i have warned everybody I, I, that is a link i'm not putting in the show no, notes I'm intrigued. I'm gonna... at yeah. first i thought oh no what are they doing and then it turned out to have nothing to do with blood bowl we, we do every now and again see like a, a uh, an r-rated blood bowl thing land one way or another where it's quite inappropriate and t- we tend to stay away yeah. from it because we want the podcast to be as family friendly as possible um so we won't be featuring yeah, exactly. what that was so that's their uh kickstarters the warg names kickstarter is going to go live soon the grebo one smashed face the cutimals team did um but i think i think it's all calm at the moment Although I did see, is it uh, the Breto- there's a Bretonian team that they've just released. I think they've got to do STLs for that at some point on Kickstarter. But I think there was a, yeah, kick- there's a couple, yeah. couple coming, I think, in a couple of weeks' time, but no real detail. And uh, no, the Chaos Dwarf one was from Marini Studio. That's their next month's Patreon, and we'll come to that in just a moment. Fantastic. Um, right, a couple of other bits on news before we move on to the egregious hobby section. I uh, just want to say hello and thank you to our new patrons, uh, Saul Alexander, Gents, uh, Paul Saunders, Pixel D, Alejandro Hoyos, uh, Dave Brisk, Alex Davey, Ian Triplo, and Car Wolves. Thank you very much for joining us on the Patreon. You get to hang out and do cool things like this. And now we're catching up with almost everything. I'm nearly there. We've still got the, the comp- couple of competitions to help wrap up. So the, the story one. And uh, I'm, I'm determined to compile those alternate uh, roster entries at least in one way or another, because they were very, very cool. So we, we are getting there. The loot's all gone out. So hopefully um, going into August, we should be free to start doing more competitions and things in good faith. So thank you to everybody who's been patient, waiting for their goodies. Um, I will do better in the future because Ben has promised to uh, help me out and uh, hold me to account, which is very important. But no, fantastic. Right, let's take a quick break and we'll chat hobby. Okay, so hobby, games, buying, building, and printing. Ian Triplo, you have spoken about having a week off. And when you have a week off, you tend to do some real-world hobby. But real-world or toy-world hobby, what have you been up to? Uh, so just real-world this week. Uh, uh, built a skin board at the start of the week because just nice. found a piece of wood that needed building and uh, took that down to the beach and uh, failed every agility test I could. <laughs> um so yeah no no real hobby for me this week uh i did a bit of a panic printing last week to get skill rings for my league games which i've had one last week and one this week oh um, fantastic in games. which um which but, uh, skill rings are you using was it the one ring to rule them all uh it was the one ring to rule them all yeah 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 so uh, lots of tiny little skills to print out and the classic because i'm playing with owa that there are a million skills to put on, but lots of loner. Lots of yeah. Oh yeah, that's see with the skill rings. I was like, I don't know if I'll bother doing anything except the adjustments, um, just because I think it's easy, easier that way. The, the, I like those skill rings, and the thin ones are going to be really useful. But if there's only one skill, I I, I think I print them out double space just because it's a little bit easier. But I know you've got the long game in mind with your league team. And also, it's quite helpful with the old, what does a dwarf have in OWA? Because oh, they're all a fair. little bit different. Oh, that's incredibly yeah, very... fair, actually. Oh, OWA, you were so close. 
Yeah. Yeah. Brawler, armbar, loner, three and a half plus. Uh, yeah. Ah, yeah. oh, why? So close. Um, someone on one of the videos today, but I think it was the videos, posted a really good suggestion, which was about um an undead version of OWA or Renegades. Um, talking about zombie players of different races. I was like, why is there not like a, a zombie team with like a zombie dwarf, some zombie dwarfs, some orcs and things like that? And I was like, actually, that's a very cool idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, Games Workshop don't seem to mind making teams that cost you six boxes to make. So I don't know, that would be quite entertaining mm. to do. Anyway, BT, you're a bit of a, a hobby machine these days. How are you coping uh, with the egregious British heat that I appreciate is probably just fine in most other countries around the world? Yeah, I <laughs> well, we we've got our, like heavily insulated houses, which which aren't great. Um, they great in like, winter. Half the year. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, no, I've I've done quite a lot. Um, I actually have an update that isn't just Necrons for a change. Don't get me wrong, I've done a lot of Necrons. Um, but I also painted two more nobility bodyguards for the tournament in a couple of days at. Sand Bowl, Isle of Wight. Literally a couple well, of days. The Sand Bowl tournament is not a place in the Isle of Wight. I think it's in Shanklin. <laughs> no, but, we've um, renamed it. That area is yeah, Sand Bowl. Not Sand Bowl or Sand Down or whatever. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. So I've painted two more nobility guys. So I just have one more journeyman to paint up uh, for the league team. And then the team's pretty much be fully done. It, it's a done team already, but I need, I need journeymen because I throw a die. Um, uh, throwers yeah, always no, die. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why it is. In terms of Necrons, I, I've, I've kind of been blitzing through a whole bunch. I've uh, been doing loads of destroyers, so I've done a lot of blades, um, a lot of uh, Lich Guard as well, so even more blades. So I've kind of just been painting blades in silver for a long time. Um, it's it's getting there. It's, it's, it's a long haul. Um, about halfway through the whole thing now, but I've watched ten seasons of The Walking Dead, so that's a weird, that's kept me going through it. Oh my god! Yeah. How? <laughs> how are you not? It, it's how I time the project. I time it with how long the series is. Oh I'm my hoping god. to finish one back. Walking Dead is is <laughs> what has got to be one of the most depressing shows I have ever watched. I loved it most of it until they started killing off the people I really did like. Uh, well, you can't get. It's, it's worse than Game of Thrones for getting attached to characters. Like <laughs> you don't. It is. It is so much worse it. than Game of Thrones. Like it just. Yeah. I've never had any experience of like hope being used as a currency than in that series. <laughs> uh, so as soon as someone gets get into like any moment of peril, you're just like, oh no, they're going, they're going to die here. This no, is no, like, no, even no, they've no. Been in. It's not even that bad. It's, it's as soon as someone starts to become likable. Like, there's no trust there. <laughs> that show has ruined my interpersonal relationships. I'm like, oh, this guy's really cool. I bet he dies horribly in the next week. Like, it's just terrible. I've never got over it. <laughs> good show, though. Good uh, show. It's, it good is, watching, it's good for watching more painting. It's very bingeable. Uh, I, so. approve, I approve of that. Um, so, you guys mentioned League. I have not been able to make it to any League nights due to um, a horrific work schedule at the moment. Um, as we're going through some restructure stuff and all kinds of things that just make much more work. Uh, and, you know, COVID is back as well, which is significantly useful. Thank you, everybody, for uh, isolating in the world. Uh, so would you see 600,000 people in the country isolated now? I'm going to record. And we're back. Sorry about that, guys. Um, you probably didn't notice anything if you're just listening to the podcast feed, but I had a very minor power cut, which meant that everything stopped. So I don't know what you heard. We talked about Walking Dead. I questioned Ben's moral uh, moral values because of it. Uh, and uh, I can't remember where we went to from there. We were talking about League. Um, you guys, have you been to Club? Have you got some games in, in the League? Yeah. So I've played the last two weeks, so I am now one and one. I played uh, Simon's Dark Elves last week, and I think it's fair to say that um, his uh, rolling in the first half was pretty dire and kept me in the game. And then in the second half, the Dark Elves remembered that they could actually dodge, throw, run faster than everyone on my team 
Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> I was quite happy to hang on to a 2 1 loss in that one. Hang on, this is Simon um, Merton, um, right? Yeah, this oh. was, yeah. And he's running so Dark I, Elves I was, this time. I was quite, he's running Dark Elves, yeah. Ugh. So that was pretty bad last week. And then this week I had Richard Anderson. Um, oh, Richard's nice. And that was a really good fun game. And so he was playing Wood Elves, but uh, Wood Elves with just one war dancer and two catchers. Ooh, went for um, an alternate build. Yeah. So I I got the ball first half, and after pushing a load of Wood Elves around for about three turns, um, it finally settled into a very slow grind up the pitch, and I scored in turn my turn eight, I think. So pretty good. Um, I managed to get the tree oh, four squares away from the end zone, which I was pretty impressed with. Going for the um, tree touchdown. Nice. I, I did contemplate it at one point and then realised I'd needed about six more turns. Um, <laughs> uh, so first half was good. He scored quickly at the start of the second half um, and then some dodges started to go badly for him. Um, I think he had Two, one, re-roll, one dodges. So it's always good when a wood elf trips over um, while dodging. Um, and I grinded through the second half and scored again in turn eight. So got a two-one, uh, killed a dar- uh, killed a wood elf, uh, got an MVP on the troll slayer for the second game in a row. So uh, the troll slayer gained mighty blow. Nice. Um, and pretty happy to yeah be one and one have all my original team handy and I've still got I've got ninety five k in the treasury so working out whether I want to go wow yeah. human thrower catcher or apothecary oh you've just bragged about having all your players alive I feel like the apothecary might be a good idea now <laughs> Otherwise... I can always print some more <laughs> <laughs> is that what you're going to do this time round I mean this is the episode to talk about that on. Um, Oh, oh, so they, it's a completely printed team. So yeah, not not a not a Games Workshop miniature in sight. Oh no, I just mean are you going to print a new guy every time somebody dies? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm glad you're not <laughs> running your half. Yeah, right. That's 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 clever, and uh, I like that. I think that's good, Ian. I think that's really good. Uh, BT, have you had any games at the league with? <laughs> No, I've I've been pretty pretty poor in attendance on the league. Um, just with so much other stuff going on now, things are opening up. Um, I've been you know reserving that spot for anyone else who wants to pop down. Um, and I've been just sort of using the free nights to catch up with other things. Um, however, I am looking forward to things going back. I'm still one game into the league with an ability. Um, still missing my my dead thrower. Um, oh yeah, of course. I've got a journeyman to replace him. Uh, yeah, I need to start getting some cash back and bringing in some bodyguards instead. I think the other throw has leveled up, so I'm looking forward to actually having a bit of throw now. Um, he's got accurate, so um, Ooh, you went with accurate. Yeah, yeah, I decided to go with accurate. Get get some passing in instead of the third reroll. Go for going for the accurate play instead. No, Who no, needs no. a reroll if you make the pass the first time? <laughs> I guess a two plus pass <laughs> is better off that way. Yeah, you got you got me there. That's cool. Um, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't know when I'll be able to make it back to to club. It's going to be a ropey few weeks. I think I'd like to come back as soon as possible, but I don't know. I wouldn't even know which team I'd want to run right now. I mean, we've got <laughs> Snotlings ready for the weekend. Um, I don't know if that. I don't know if I'd want them to be my league team. Like they are fun. They are very fun, but I don't know if that's. I don't know if that's uh, enough shenanigans for me. I feel like that's just. Good for. Black Orcs, surely, ben. I do love the Black Orcs. Uh, well, yeah, but all right. If Ben's running nobility, I'll run the Black Orcs. Uh, yeah, I think that's fair. Get the uh, the Black Mountain Buccaneers on the pitch proper. Ooh, I dropped Hackflem on my paint. That's probably going to go well. Um, no, that's cool. I mean, just living for this tournament season of well, you know, season of two tournaments. So again, really excited for Saturday, Ben. Where we got? I know it's a bit of an yeah. early, early start to travel over to the Isle of Wight, but I don't know. Yeah, it'll be good. 
first time we travelled anywhere for a tournament for a very long time. And I don't know, I'm super excited about it. The tournament structure is quite interesting. I only talked about it last week, but having to have a star player is interesting at the moment and definitely definitely the main reason I'm painting up Hackflim right now as we record. Uh, because yeah. <laughs> I need to get it ready for Saturday. And now I've got loads of time. Like It's Thursday night. Like It's not Friday night. Like, I normally... <laughs> Twice as much time as you normally have. I know, this is crazy. I'm not doing a good job of painting him either. But, you know, that's uh, one of the benefits of the 3D printer is I'm like, ooh, need a hack for them. Chuck it on, get the print on the go, and he's done, and you're ready to go. Um, and that is yeah, absolutely. that is pretty sweet, though, just being able to jump on and do that. Um, so, yeah. I mean... Hobby wise, it's been very much a case of getting some videos in. It's been very relaxing, actually. Ben, you and I got a game in, trying to film the new we series did. with some, ironically, some some tech issues, where my new uh, mics didn't work very well. They worked, but they were very quiet, and then led to the audio being absolute garbage. So we binned that off, played the rest of our game, which was Snotlings, piloted by me, and Black Orcs, piloted by Ben, and somehow, yeah. Ended up on a one-all draw. I did, yeah. It's that, it's, especially as you had some really horrendous rolls. Oh, the first half was awful. It's so many skulls. But... Yeah, I'm. I'm kind uh, of it was glad just... that the tech failed on that one because I would have hated for the the, yeah. the YouTube series to open with the Snotlings having that much bad luck. I also we also remembered that. Blackhawks had grab about halfway through the first oh, half, which yeah. would have made a huge difference in all the sidesteps. So grab versus that was, sidestep. Yeah, it was yeah. kind of just a, yeah. I mean, we've already had all one round. Tour. It was a little bit difficult. It was. Uh, it was. A, we were a bit rusty for the rules, rusty on the filming, yeah. and then my shiny new technology didn't play out because apparently, when it comes to tech right now, I am cursed. Like I must have done something. To upset the machine spirit somewhere, the Omnisire is incredibly angry with me and is therefore cursing me with bad technology stuff. Um, and you know what? That's okay because sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad, and most of the time it's just fine. But between the iOS update wrecking my ability to edit nice and quickly, and uh, the mics that I bought not being good and it turning out being a waste of a hundred and something pounds, ah, oh, just a bit annoyed at the technology aspect. However. Doesn't really matter. We'll get it right and it'll be fine. And we can start filming again soon. Yep. But I am literally living for this weekend because that tournament, yes. that trip is going to be wicked. Uh, ben, I know we joked about recording some of the podcasts. Now I'm not driving. Uh, it should be easier, actually, on the crossing for us to do a little bit of filming and just chat about the tournament and things. So it could be quite an entertaining podcast next time. Um, bone, <laughs> bone head out to see. You know, yeah, it's gonna be. I see, I don't know what the Wi-Fi. Ferry recording. I don't know what the Wi-Fi is like on the on the ferry, but I don't know. We could probably just have a little go live session on a Saturday morning on the way to the <laughs> tournament. Could be quite entertaining. Well, actually, yeah, no. Who's gonna watch that? I don't know. <laughs> America's are asleep. People, <laughs> people else is home asleep. on a Saturday morning, uh, wanting to be us going to a Blood Bowl tournament, probably. Um, <laughs> like 7am yeah, yeah. yeah it is going to be an early start <laughs> but it's going to be good fun so we've got that to look forward to then we can do some more filming and things and uh, yeah. I don't know that should be that should be really 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 good right guys anything more on hobby before we move into the main topic we'll just bounce to the chat and see if there's any ch uh, questions in there before we move on as well I will bit. say um, I've, I've got a game tomorrow which I'm looking forward to I'm going to be trying out Arabellum's Conquest for the first time, which oh, is you're getting not Conquest Blood Bowl to the tabletop, Ben. Yeah, I'm having a demo game in Southampton. Um, that's really exciting. Uh, I've got in touch with some of the guys who kind of like pioneer, like, like community managers, kind of community volunteers. Um, you can chat to some of them and, the, and get involved with that because that game looks really fun and it's got some kick ass huge models which I really like so they are I'm huge. like the opposite of you Ben I like the big scale and <laughs> you're like the 10 millimeter guy yeah. uh, it's only because the 6 mil stuff doesn't print up that great just yet but that's okay one day <laughs> 6 mil will be there we'll be there yeah. uh, right in chat Paul is saying our country's biggest carnivore and you never see them ninja badges uh, I said you see them dead on the road he said you see them on dead on the road but that's because cars don't see them which is actually incredibly accurate very good point 
Uh, is that <laughs> Kislev Flesh? That is Kislev Flesh. That's good. Uh, Tyler, I kind of enjoy seeing beat, the beat behind the scenes of it all. Makes you feel like I'm there. Yeah, sorry, Tyler. Um, there's a bit of editing that you goes are, into Hed. this show. But yeah, you are part of the show. <laughs> Hurley no. Boy, have you ever seen the Badger Parade? What the heck is the Badger Parade? Uh, liminality uh, with some stuff that can kill Mamus in Australia. Australia is great. Australia is like the Katachan of the real world, isn't it? It's just everybody's so chilled Everywhere because like oh, they just there's just going to be a random encounter that just kills them. It must be like rolling. It just must be like having a go for it. Like I'm going to go for work. Time to roll a go for it. See if I die. Absolutely awesome. Uh, One in big chance of imminent death. <laughs> oh, Hurley Boy says Simon really was not happy last week. Ooh. At Paul. Oh, were, there was a, a lot of swearing. <laughs> <laughs> that is, though, that is just Blood Bowl. Um, and Paul says, got to play two games of sevens with my Skaven Thrashed Lizards, surprisingly. Interesting. Uh, I don't know. If you take out the Skinks, Lizards are helpless in sevens, which is uh, which is interesting. Kind of keeps them in check, which I do like. Uh, and then with orcs that thrash Skaven who tried to play like orcs. Interesting. There is there is a mm -hmm. there is like a subset of Skaven coach that want to play a bash just to prove that they can play bash. Um, Rich he tried that, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. And he yeah. did pretty well, I think. Um, yeah. And there are some people who have convinced me that actually the the Skaven build starting with four gutters may not be the optimal way of doing it. Um, starting with two or three to have a bit more resilience in the team might be a, a good way to start the league. Definitely considering that that might be might be true. No, no, not not so. Probably on a bit of gold in this edition, though. Sorry, dude. Probably scoring scoring a lot less. But then, if you're starting with a rat ogre, it's probably not too big a deal. Yeah, you don't have to replace stuff quite so much. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. I do like the balance there. You've got a you've got a bit of a choice to make, which I do enjoy. Uh, new destin new definition: insolent fell off the Isle of Wight ferry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be it. Like we'll just uh, <clears throat> it's the next one up from power cut. From power cut is that just Ben falls in the in the ocean in between England and the Isle of Wight, um, which I realise is is in the UK, but it upsets Milton. So that's that's just quite funny. Right, guys, let's uh, take a quick break and talk about 3D printing. So, guys, in chat, more 3D printing questions, please, especially because the electricity uh, failed to go for it and uh, I lost all of your questions from before. So let's have some, some good questions and we'll talk about 3D printing in Blood Bowl. So if you're watching on the YouTube version, you will see that I have a hack phlegm here. It is not the hack phlegm from Games Workshop. This is the hack phlegm from my shed because it is 3D printed and it is from Punga. Now Punga do some absolutely wonderful models and this is definitely one of them. So we thought as Games Workshop are currently not in any hurry to produce new Blood Bowl miniatures. Oh, we forgot to talk about Frank. Frank. Frankenstein came out. Um, it's smaller than you'd want it to be, but it's still quite a cool model. There you go. That's uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's the one line summary. <laughs> it's not as big as you'd want a strength five piece to be. But anyway, we thought because Games Workshop aren't producing models, and we can, that we'd talk about 3D printing. And we've dragged Ian, who is 100% our 3D printing correspondent for the podcast, on to talk about this. So basically, we're going to have a chat about why you want to print Blood Bowl stuff, what you can look at, who's good to follow, what to watch out for, and just some general questions and some general topics, really, on 3D printing. Um I mean, first of all, let's let's go. I mean, out of you guys, who was the first one to grab a printer and why? Uh, was it you, Trips? Uh, I think it was me it. with the... I think I got the plastic one, then you got a resin one, yeah. then you got the plastic one, then I got the resin one, and yeah. then we dragged Ben into it. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> that was it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Locked, lockdown caused five printers to turn up between the three of us. 
I haven't pulled Very the trigger true. on the plastic one, but actually that's probably a really good place to start, guys. Um, so we're talking about Blood Bowl models here. So this that I've got here is a Elegoo Mars, and it is a resin printer. There are two main types of printer, really, aren't there? Which is the resin one, which is good for models, and the plastic one, which, I mean, Ben, I've seen some of the terrain you've printed for 40k and things. Like, is that the main difference between the two different types of printer? Size is really it. Size... I like I'd say price, but sometimes not even that. I like in terms of like sheer size of the model, then yeah, the plastic one is cheaper, but resin's not that expensive anyway. In term like when you start weighing up weight, it's really not that much in it. Um, uh, yeah, it's main the main thing is size versus quality. It's a lot easier to print bigger things on a plastic, and it's a lot nicer to print smaller things on a resin. But yeah, resin's more detailed essentially. Then is it? Yes. Yeah, a lot more very, detailed. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And that's really to do with how they print, isn't it? Um, I mean, I don't know if it's similar technology or not, but the resin stuff just—I don't know. I try to explain to people at work, trying to explain to muggles how it actually prints is really challenging. Um, I, I've always <laughs> tried to use the—you know—those three D puzzles you get, those three D sculptures of like the pharaoh's head yeah. and things. That's just absolute slices and slices and slices. Try to explain it like that. That's how they build it up, and it comes up. And if you do a bad job printing, you can see the lines. You can see each mm -hmm. of those levels, and it looks kind of like a broken CRT monitor. Now, you guys who are listening here know that uh, when it comes to stuff, I can be particularly lazy. So I have got a 3D printer. I am not, but maybe not lazy, just not disciplined. I'm a, I'm a little bit more cowboy than I should be, and I entirely blame my grandfather for this because he was the biggest cowboy around there. It was awesome. He also taught us how to make paraffin uh, bows and uh, paraffin arrows when we were about nine years old. So that was fun. Apart from the time I nearly killed a horse with a flaming arrow. Um, I anyway. don't know. Do you admit that? Is that something you admit on like oh, recordings? <laughs> well, I think it's important. Say that. It's a, it's a life lesson, you know. Uh, it's great it's to, to make fire weapons. He did. He did. It was yeah. awesome, um, terrifying, and and basically the lesson was don't do it. And that's kind of the lesson you can only learn by doing it. And I think that was his master plan. I mean. Maybe it wasn't, I don't know, but I'm giving him the credit to say that he helped us learn the, our own lesson, which was that flaming arrows, while cool, aren't that safe, uh, which I had to discover for myself. Anyway, these days, I'm aware of that, and it probably led towards me being a compliance manager. Um, <laughs> I the other fire, the flaming irony of this. Anyway, I'm a bit of a cowboy, and I have, for the most part, had very few problems with the printer. And it's really straightforward. Like, Ben, when you got into it, you started showing loads of the discipline. You shared your settings with me, which was wicked. And I think I just started printing stuff before you even got halfway through telling me what I needed to do. And most of it was absolutely fine. And yeah, yeah, exactly. It was more the, the early advice was more just all the hurdles that you've come across anyway. So... It's not like you can't print without it. It just helps, like, troubleshoot. That's a lot of the stuff I was telling you. And and part of the ho part of the hobby is learning those things and going, yeah. why is it not worked? And what did I, what did I skip that I probably shouldn't have skipped? That's an important thing to mention because if you don't enjoy that, you probably won't enjoy owning a printer. <laughs> and I always say that. I, I think that's what we yeah, had. They are not plug and play. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, they they are plug and play just just once. Um, yeah. <laughs> you plug it, play it, then you need to take it apart, drain it, clean it, and do everything. And that's what we did see in chat before I blew up the house. Uh, was that actually there was a bunch of questions in there from our patrons saying like the one thing that's put me off is the maintenance, is having to take it apart and put it back together again, having to clean it, having to do all that. Um, but this is the thing, and I think it's a it is incredibly true, right? when it breaks you do have to to fix it but i seem to go like four or five weeks without a, a problem at all it just farms prints and then i end up with a whole bunch of stuff i don't need and then it will break then something will go wrong and that brings me to my first point now we print for blood bowl and there's a ton of resource out there um and the cool thing is that there are some patreons that do specifically blood bowl stuff i mean 
guys other than other than Punga, what who else is out there in the Patreon sphere? The R N E Studio. He has quite a lot. Or yep, they? Yep. I'm still not quite sure. Um, yeah, well, they do a team every, team every month, so they're really good. Yeah. So, Most of your um, OWA is that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I've used the uh, humans from that team and a few of the dwarves. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a few other. There's a lot of people that will do the odd Blood Bowl miniature, and there's a lot of miniatures which can be used for Blood Bowl. You just need to find the weaponless versions. Yeah. That is so mm -hmm. true. Um, uh, when it comes to and weaponless... Then the other place... No, 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 you go, man, you go. Well, I was going to say, then the other place is look um, Kickstarters up, because a lot of people who've done fantasy football kickstarters their patrons will have those files as stls now or will now do teams and details and um i follow cross lancers and part of their patron and they're the halflings and the uh princesses and all the uh, the leprechaun odd, guys odd balls. yeah um but there's there's a lot of well my mini factory is probably the other place to look if you yeah. if you want to spend two hours trying to find the ideal miniature, my mini factory is a place that will happily uh, keep you busy and then take your money at the end of it for a while. And it's not even yeah. that much sure. money. So Patreon is a great place. You can support creators, and we've got a whole bunch of patrons on live with us now. It's it, Patreon's a great place to support people who are doing just stuff you like it's it's like a donation thing to support people and we massively appreciate ours because it means i can buy equipment that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't um like our new mics that i feel robbed by but um you know so there's the patreon angle where there's punga who i gotta say probably the best blood bowl patron out there they do half a team each month which then works out basically at 20 pounds per team of stl files and you can print a ton of it out and it's great fun to do and they've got all the star players and stuff. Val value wise, that's not bad. Um, because it probably costs about ten pounds to print an entire team and they are supported. Uh Cross Lances do some stuff, RNE Studio do their range that they're releasing now as Patreon models. Uh, I don't know if theirs is entirely supported, Ian. Uh the older models aren't, the yeah. newer models are. Um but I'm a fan of unsupported miniatures. Ooh, we will come to that in a second. You mentioned um, my mini factory, and that is, and this is something that has become a hobby in of itself for me. Now, before there was the 3D printing, I used to love, I mean, it was a kind of a trope actually, and I probably haven't come away that far from it, of finding models that are not supposed to be used for Blood Bowl and finding a way to want to use them and putting them to use in Blood Bowl. It's great fun, I like the personal challenge of it, and it mostly revolves in me ending up with a bunch of giant models. Uh, but my mini factory and Colts 3D are, and Thingiverse to an extent, are full of brilliant models that can be used for anything. So there's a couple of other Patreons out there as well, but most Patreon STL producers also put their files on my mini factory so you can pick them up and um, and you can print them out. Big guys, this is, if you like big guys in Blood Bowl, you are spoiled. So naturally, I'm well on board with this. So I follow uh, Duncan Shadow Luca, uh, support him on Patreon, and he has got a load of cool stuff. There's Minotaurs galore, all this kind of stuff. So if you're looking for a big guy, whether it's an ogre, a minotaur, trolls, whatever, big guys are just everywhere and they're cheap and you can get exactly the one you want if you want a fire elemental looking guy if you want a minotaur there's just anything you can want and that i think is probably the most exciting thing about 3d printing but once you've found a model or a patreon you like the first thing that i remember ben telling me about is where possible pick up one that is supported now when you got you guys have all bought games workshop models you've all bought uh, resin models supports basically the 3d version of a sprue okay it where the sprue uh, on plastic injection molding allows the plastic to get around to all the bits of the mold to fill the model out the supports allow the print to hold itself together while it prints all of the parts of the model and um, a lot of stls out there are completely unsupported 
and some of them are very supported. So the Punga stuff, I blooming love. Some of it's a little bit over supported, but you can just chuck them all on the base plate in Chitu box or whatever, slice it, print it. You know it's going to uh, pass print every time, and you can just print unlimited Blood Bowl. Okay. But then there are the models that are not supported. Now, Ian, could you just talk us through the pros and cons of unsupported minis? So uh, let's start with the cons because that's the easy one. So the, the cons are you can't just stick it on the plate and print it because it will just be a globule of uh, semi-cured resin at the end of it. So if you don't have a supported miniature, it just won't print full stop. So you're going to have to print it. You're going to have to support it yourself, um, which takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, and uh, there's a couple of main slicing programs that are out there they will do auto supports to an extent you've got to get a little bit used to it um and but the pros of it for me the biggest pro of it is because the model's not pre-supported you can orient it in whichever axis you want you can place them exactly on the plate as you want um and i find i can squeeze a few more models on there um, and some pre-supported minis come with pre-supports that are pretty damn thick, <laughs> thick as a tree trunk, I think is the uh, phrase. So you can it gives you that ability to really to, to do it to the level you want to. Now, I think we've all had a little bit of experience with some over-supported models. Uh, you two in particular, the Pirates of Orc Bay? The, mm. Yeah, the, the Pirates of Orc Bay, which have... Uh, more resin in the support than in, even in the huge trolls I, I think that's probably right now the plus side the models never fail but clearing the supports off are pretty tricky and the dwarves from punga just the supports were so chunky um that when i printed out the blitzers because they were reverse supported and had them attached to the blitzers wings on the helmet i i've got like a graveyard pile of blitzers with broken helmets because they just kept Not. snapping off because it was over supported and 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 trips is completely right when it comes to it gives you that more control and i think there's the there's a there's the competency theory isn't there but also when it comes to technology um like this is the the classic one is step one get stuff that does it for you learn why it does it then do it yourself and then you become on the hipster end of it where you're like I want to do my own stuff because I get it because I grok it. And that's the difference between like an iPhone user and one of the other, uh, you know, operating systems where it's like I have access to do everything, but nothing does it for me straight away. Um, and that 3D printing is is bang on that. You can get the simple entry level stuff where it's all supported for you and it does it. But then once you understand the theory, you can do it yourself and you get better results i think is probably ultimately is you get better results but it does cost you time um now we've got a couple of questions in chat here um paul straight in there with best printer type resin i assume i think guys for blood bowl miniatures resin is where it's at um yeah, um, yeah. Bowl, yeah. i mean i've had a pretty catastrophic failure with my printer this week which i'll come to in a minute on the definite cons of printers but i mean I've got a really entry level one, which was the Mars. I don't even think it's a pro. I don't think it's a two. No. I think it's just an Elegoo Mars. And it cost £200 with resin. <laughs> it's been fantastic. But there's the two, there's the pro. Now there's 4K printers, Ben. Do you, do you, what's the crack with 4K printers? That's just referring to the resolution of the screen. So the. The, the way the resin printers work is you have a what is essentially a mobile phone screen um, that acts as a glorified UV light and uh, a resin a, a tray comes down picks up about you know 0.04 millimeters of resin or forms a gap and then the phone screen itself will light up an image and silhouette out where the resin needs to cure. And so you basically get an intense beam of light that cures it in a pattern. Uh, when it's a higher resolution screen, like a 4K screen, you basically just get a sharper image. So it, it pretty much just refers to literally the resolution of the model. So you get a much crisper, cleaner model with a 4K printer. And if there's more as pixels, right, um, it, wouldn't, yeah. it doesn't affect the speed of printing either, does it? 
Because there's just more happening no. across the base plate. The resolution doesn't. However, what does is the type of screen. So um, where older ones like ours, Ben, are literally mobile phone screens uh, at 2K resolution, they are essentially just using a wavelength of light that's close to what is actually um, UV. Um, it's kind of simulated UV. Uh, newer printers, like most 4K printers, I can't think of any 4K printers that aren't like this. They use a monochrome screen, which literally has one type of light output, which is perfect for curing resin. And then it's either that or nothing. So that does cure a lot faster because it's it helps catalyze the reaction, which cures the resin just much, much quicker. So when we're talking about... Yeah, we did some... Sorry, drips go. We did some rough rough maths, Ben and I. I think my print is about twice as fast as Ben's. Yeah, it's, so uh... it cured each layer several seconds faster, but obviously that the, the the lifting up and going down is about the same, so that it kind of balances out to about twice as fast, even though it's technically four times faster per layer. Just gonna comes, show, show this well. to the camera screen. Uh my phone is throwing up a temperature warning, so <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's, you okay? Let's, let's turn that let's turn that off for now. So sorry guys, I've got, I did have my painting up on the screen, but that is not going to be there for a little while. Anyway, um sorry Ben. Yeah, so the the printing is is quicker on the 4K stuff. It's quicker on a 4K stuff, but not because of the resolution. It's because of the type of screens that are used in more modern printers. Yeah. Just because they give a better a more accurate output of light. Okay, fantastic. Now, on timescales, because there may be some people out there who haven't got access to printers, I mean, up until, you know, what, November, when I pulled the trigger on mine under the guise of needing to print out, uh, what was it? Oh, tree decorations for the other managers uh, that worked with me. Um, <laughs> I was like, what a lovely way to show my team how much I love them. I'll print them geeky uh, things that I didn't cure properly, but we won't mention that. Um turns into little chemical bombs so every <laughs> this christmas when all my managers open their christmas decoration box there's probably just going to be this half yeah anyway um timings wise a plate of about 8 28 32 middle models is about eight hours i found like, obviously it depends on how tall they are and things like that but most of my prints are around about eight and a half to nine hours like i'll put it on before i go to bed when i wake up the print is done so it's worth noting for that's for our printers. For newer ones, like Triplo was saying, it's probably about four. Yeah, oh. mine's about three, three to four hours for a full plate of minis. That is just. I am so close to living my Star Trek: The Next Generation dreams here. Can you imagine? <laughs> like this time next year, I'm going to be able to walk into my shed. The door's going to go tss, open on its own. And I'm going to say, "Computer, print me a Blood Bowl team." And it's going to say, okay. <laughs> and then I'm going to come back one, uh, one T Earl Grey hot later and just going to have, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> have a team ready to go, which is just awesome. So, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters when you need to print a ton of stuff. But I'm, I'm one of those guys that my brother bought a 4K TV as soon as it came out because he was like, wow, look at how crap Friends looks now. Um, because it just looks like they're in the room with you. And I was like, yeah, but like my 32 inch screen is just fine. Like it's the same movie. So I have always been accepting of pretty good, like the Elegoo Mars for 150 pounds prints out stuff in nine hours. And that's pretty good. Like anything more than yeah, that it is. is just awesome. But if you think about, uh, you know, a printer's been like a year old and is awesome. And now everyone that's coming yeah. out gets cheaper and gets better and better and better. And when it comes to Blood Bowl, I mean, Trips, if you're printing a plate of models in, in four hours, how long did your entire OWA team take to print? Uh, probably two days of prints. Um, yeah, so it wasn't too bad. And I got the, the the washing and the curing is a bit that you probably have to add on after every print. It's uh, the first thing to probably say about anyone who doesn't know about printing is when you get a resin miniature off the printer, uh, the first thing you don't do is touch it because mm -hmm. uh, that will A, ruin you and B, ruin it. Uh, so um, you do have to, to wash the resin off them and then cure them either with a 
um, a curing station or in the lovely British summer uh, works quite nicely. But yeah, when when the when you can run two plates in a day, that really speeds up the printing and it, it means you can panic print a team. So, yeah, panic. But yeah, imagine that print, paint, everything. And it's all oh, been there's a 24 hour challenge there somewhere in there. Um, I think we've had that idea of just then that's it. You print, print and paint a team in a weekend. <laughs> okay, let's, done. let's find you a weekend. Know. Let's find a weekend in September when the temperature's gone back to normal. And there's no tournaments to go to. Uh, yeah. you know, I think we could do this. I think we could do that. I think that'd be great fun. So um, I guess there's uh, the next step to talk about is the effort that goes into printing. Like the one hand, there is the glorified version of I found these files online. I chucked them on a USB stick, plugged it in the printer, went to sleep, woke up, had a bunch of stuff. Supporting is one challenge. Some places will be supported and you can just chuck it on there. You guys said that actually I like printing a load of small scale stuff. I do. War Master. I've got some absolutely awesome Forest Dragon ships over there that I printed which are just delicious man of war scale. And it's all printed like it's all supported. It is just how much can I fit on this plate and it prints and it doesn't fail and I scrape it off and then there is clear up. There is definitely clean up. So Ben made some suggestions to me. My process is take it off the uh take it off the plate which Ian says you know use PPE you've got some gloves drop them off then I chuck them in a dirty um, wash first which is not white spirit it's methylated the meth, meth spirits uh, I, I referred to it as white spirits one day and Ben just had like this horrible like what have you done you're like it was amazing <laughs> and that's what that's what reminded me this is what reminded me of my granddad's flaming arrows is because I was like, I'm pretty sure this is the, that, you know, white spirit. Yeah, that's the smell. Um, that char and fear, uh, horse fear. Um, so, yeah, give it a dirty wash. Takes off a load of the outstanding resin. Um, then you want to do a clean wash as well. What I have found is because of the way I've got my station set up, I can just, there. I have water right there as well. But Ben suggested a really good trick which is have some very hot water not quite boiling but you know boil the kettle dunk it in some water clean up the model in your your cleaning chemicals chuck it in the hot water because then it just kind of makes the the support soft because the way supports are done it's very much like plastic sprues there is a very small point connecting the support to the model they just come off like you can just unpick them then you can clean it up again and then leave it to dry and then yeah using a uv light or a cleaning station or the sun at the moment which has been pretty cool i, I can't lie i did think oh, i'm saving 35p on electricity here which apparently my house yeah. is big on doing at the moment um i mean as the sun goes it's a pretty pretty good uv light or as uv lights go the sun is a pretty good yeah, one. it's not bad you yeah. know i mean <laughs> tip it is it is work and i one amazing trick Right, that I love. Actually, I've got two amazing tricks for you. The first of all is you don't have to clean it up quite so much if you forget that you've left the print on the tray and you don't come back to it for like four days. A lot of the resin tends to drip off. Uh, that's uh, that does help on cleaning up time, but not. Yeah, watch out for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've done that several times and be like, oh, that's on there still. I can take that off and clean that up. And the second is if you cannot be bothered to clean your models immediately but you want to put another print on tin foil this is something that i have done multiple times i've got a roll of tin foil in the uh in the shed i'll rip a square off i'll take the models off a plate put it in the tin foil wrap it up like leftover chinese food the sun cannot get to it chuck it uh, chuck it aside and you can go back and clear it up and it hasn't it's been perfect every single time now i don't mean leave it there for a month but if you need, if you're like, I've got to go to work. I want to change the print over, but I don't have time to clean models up now. Chuck it in some uh, tin foil. Come back to it tomorrow. It's absolutely fine. Like that has been brilliant for me. And when I was printing those teams from Punga for the prizes, that that saved me because I could be like, right, print, do this, go to work, print, go this, do the work. Got three prints there. Clean them all up in one go. Fantastic. That was my little trick. Uh, but I just that's a good idea. Like I said, lazy slash cowboy. 
um you know I, yeah. I, can, I can see you can if you're watching on the youtube version you can see ben and ian just being like what's this guy doing this is a terrible advice don't do this they're gonna go well, goofy. let's not condone leaving a, a death ball of tinfoil with dripping yeah. red in it on the garage when you walk in not encourage that but when, you, it's not bad <laughs> when you walk in my, my shed there is a big plastic skull full of blood bowl dice that is its own warning Keep out of reach of children. That's that's probably a big thing to say. Is if you have kids, probably don't put this stuff near where they can get to it because it's extremely harmful. Yeah, that's. Um, that's I'm I'm pretty bad. I'm like Ben. Um, sometimes I don't want to waste all my gloves, so I have one glove and one hand which I sacrifice. <laughs> and uh, so, like, I'm picking off. <laughs> well, it, it helps when you pick off the, uh, the 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 resin from the from the models. I kind of just use my sacrificial hand and and do get all the picking and then it does itch for about a day. All right. Uh, So Ben, Ben, I'm going to upset you. Yeah, probably wearing your gloves. I'm going to upset you right now. (laughs) Do you remember when I first got the printer, you were like, hey, here's some gloves to tide you over? Yeah. Still using those gloves. It's the clock. (laughs) I've got... good for the environment. I've got a box of black ones, like I've ordered but I have these two blue gloves. Now, the back of the hand of one of them has come away, which means it's like, you know, if you do weights, like, or, you know, you can get those gloves that kind of do up at the back. I've got one of those, which means they slip on really easily so I can take it off there. But yeah, it does definitely run the risk of getting um, all kinds of chemicals over your hand, which is not recommended. So viewers are aware, this is almost a year ago that I gave them those gloves. <laughs> it was November. It was before Christmas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> So yeah, my prints are powered by friendship. Thank you, Ben. Jeez, in chat, Leonard. Yeah, no, not wow. recommended. When I do the clean up, fresh gloves go on. This is just quick gloves to take it off, and and that's my like quick. I need to go to work. Let's take the print off and put another one on. Wrap it in dim foil. Off I go. Terrible idea. So these are things you could not do, but they're things you yeah. could get away with, but shouldn't. Um, and that I guess yeah, comes from really bad things. Yeah. <laughs> Get some reusable no, lab gloves. gloves. I've gloves, got them. <laughs> um, goggles. The big thing, actually, oh, this is something this I definitely is something do, really and important. a huge thing. Yeah, if you because resin needs a good shake to get it ready to go. Like you need to really shake it, um, mix it all up, makes it all consistent. Um, do wear goggles when shaking this because I've shaken the bottle and I've heard horror stories and people have the lid loose and it smashes all over them and you do not want that anywhere near your face. Um, I once shook it, and while the lid didn't come off, there were bits of resin that had dripped down the sides yeah. from the lid. That did flick and hit me on the cheek, and uh, at the time I didn't have goggles on. Uh, ever since that happened, I now wear goggles, because yeah. that was very close standing in my eye, and that would have done a lot of damage. Yeah, so, this is bang on. You're using yeah. corrosive material, and just resin is just a, it's just such a bad situation. Now, this is something I do pride myself on. So when you buy the resin pots... Um, they come in like corrugated plastic like bubble wrap um, that kind of got like a lid on it. So I actually store mine still in that. So when I shake it, it's it's oh. sealed in that, that bottle because I think you told me the story, Ben. Um, like if I get a bit of resin on my hand, it's my risk and, you know, I, it's it's not great, but it's a minimal thing. But no, eyes are really important. Goggles are a great idea. Disposable gloves are a great idea. Reusable gloves that Lenart's popped in there. Um, get some reusable lab gloves or something. It's actually genius like that's a really good thing anyway those are a load of things but you can get away with later. But no, not later not later cheap nitro yeah, cheap um, nitro yeah that's yeah it, it's so important yeah. because this is chemicals now the same could be said using super glue okay uh, we as a as modelists we use a bunch of chemicals that you do have to be careful with so when it comes to doing all this stuff be safe but humans are terrible and my job is to convince people to do the same safe things a hundred times even though nothing's gone wrong ever and it's very difficult because people are terrible uh pulls off up to bed off to bed up early and i'm old we'll have to listen to the rest of it when it's uploaded night pool pool thanks very much for hanging out with us man appreciate it so safety yes clean up a lot of work curing not a lot of work you technically just have to kind of wait cleaning it properly stops your models from being tacky and this is something i really struggled with at first and that that's been almost obliterated doing the double clean with a dirty um, chemical and then a clean chemical wash afterwards and a bit of a brush action or two or toothbrush or something just to get it in there and there is nothing better than having a model dry and just feel like 
actual actual resin like you could have bought it like that is just awesome so we kind of talked through the the life cycle of of a model and i have to ask you the biggest question of all um would you rather print a team or buy a team i'll let trip start print a hundred percent now all right uh, having run a run a printed team to a tournament and a printed team to a league because it's a hobby for a hobby it's part of my hobby routine now there's quite a sense of pride about you found a team you printed it you put it together and then it it you print uh, painted it as well it's for me it's it's part of the hobby now you're literally building your own models bt what about you uh for some reason, I was actually was thinking about this. Um, I still think print. I think to me, there's really not a lot of difference between. It's gotten to the point now where I get the same satisfaction from doing either. Um, but printing is just a lot more affordable. Um, so I'd print one. Like now, now I have the printer. Obviously, there's upfront costs involved in a printer. But in the long run, it saves you a lot. Um, it makes you a lot less likely to just buy the odd model. And sometimes when there's just one thing you need, it's really expensive to do that for buying bits and things or like secondhand models that just don't really fit with what you've already got. Printing makes that a lot easier. Um, so like, I don't know, I think for me, it's just printing. You can supplement it a lot easier than you can with a board team and it's just for anyway. So and you can have the a, a, a player, you drop a player, you break its arm. You just print another one. You paint yeah. it again. You, you want a journeyman? You print a print a, a lineman, and you paint them up. You, you want, want a model that looks a bit different. You mirror yeah. it. And mirror it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the trick. That's the trick. So yeah. I individual models like star players, uh, big guys, stuff like that. Absolutely. Like, but for me, the time you have to put into printing it it depends like games workshop teams norba teams teams that are priced 30 pounds or under i think it it's just a no-brainer for me i would still buy a team rather than do that if a really so the thunder cougar falcon beards team landed and that was 60 pounds and there was 20 models that were beautifully made cast printed prepped ready to go that is for me still better um, for printing a whole team with stars because a whole team with stars is three or four prints plus the bit that didn't come out right and then the time spent cleaning and I think it is just that that element of, of time now Ian he's got his angle here where that's part of his hobby now is the challenge of printing it as good as possible to get the results out there uh, Ben is right it is cheaper to do so but it, it's that it's that what is important to you factor the cool thing is that we can support hobby companies by printing now. And that, for me, is the, the biggest and just most important change here. RNE Studios, Punga. Punga is a fantastic example of this. I love the models that Punga makes. I want to support them to cre creating models. They're now producing the STLs, and I can print as much as I like. They were, I spoke to them. They were like, it's fine if you want to give them away as prizes, Ben. Like, that's absolutely okay. Like, go for it. It helps them spoil, you know, it helps them get their brand out there. And it also just it keeps the cost lower. Like, it's brilliant. But Games Workshop teams, Norba, you know, Grebo, I still think I would rather buy if I wanted that team for a very good reason. What I've found with printing is I can now print stuff that I don't need and not even worry about it. Like, if a cool model came out and I wanted a cool model just for the sake of it, I'd really hum and you know hem and haw about the fact that actually a cool model to paint is thirty pounds plus. All right, it doesn't matter what it is. You want a cool hero, you want a cool unit. If you fancy painting a knight, you probably have to spend thirty-five pounds to get five of them to do a knight. If you want to paint a knight or a few knights, it's going to cost you five pounds for the STL, five pound for the resin, and you can do it in your own leisure. And you'll have them here by about the same time you'd order them. And that for me is the other thing is that time money swap and the amount of time to get it is the same so if i wanted a blood bowl team i could order it from entoyment and i could print one at the same time 
and they'd both be ready at exactly the same time. It just, it just kind of depends on how much time. But I do agree with you, one of the biggest and best, most important thing about printing is if you look at the human team from Games Workshop, all of your blitzes are exactly the flipping same. A lot of the STL stuff, you can mirror it, so they're slightly different. You can, you know, there's alternative sculpts. that you generally get more poses, yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's because it costs nothing for them to swap ahead, you know. And that is the real mm -hmm. awesome bit. And I think that's probably where, like, Ian's saying, printing my own team is so important because you've got quite a bit of customization. I had I a think, bit of a... Um... Sorry, Ian. I was going to say the other thing about the customization is the scale because it's a it's a digital model so you can scale them up scale them down uh, i think that's that makes a big difference when you look at a strength four character and you don't feel they're quite big enough well you just print them at 110 120 percent the scale or in ben's case you print them at every five cent <laughs> version until you find the one you like um Actually, but that means you yeah. can use models that aren't traditionally designed for something you can scale them up and use them for something completely different. You can also scale them down. And I think there's going to be some really fun, stunty options out there when we actually start thinking that way around as well. That is... Hey, this is a good example. There's a 75mm yeah. vampire. Scale that down. That's that's a great vampire model for Bubba. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, definitely. And that is something else that's very, very cool. But I... I... I mean, the question is, and the reason we're talking about this is one, because we want to just highlight the fact there's a ton of cool Blood Bowl stuff out there. But fundamentally, it is no different uh, raiding the D&D &D models, Ben. Uh, you know, looking through Reaper Bones to find pieces to fill for your special team, as it is rummaging around on my mini factory, Ian. Uh, now, Ian is, is a bit of a, a hawk when it comes to finding STLs. It's awesome. Uh, but, you know, the, it's the same thing. It is the same thing. It's just one is you put more effort in and it turns up quicker and that's cool it is it is approaching parity now and that biggest fear is that 3d printing will kill off miniatures but i don't i really nah, from don't think that's gonna be the case i think i think i should we get into that that discussion of sort of like ethics and is that yeah is that I worth think that's where we're headed anything? yeah we've yeah talk, we've talked about how that's... we've talked about why now we need to talk about what happens yeah that's a good segue. I, I, I'm really passionate about this. Um, I think sometimes it is blown up. It's obviously a huge discussion in the, in the hobby world, um, this printing thing. I think I personally see it as only a good thing. I think it's allowed so much more in terms of the art side of it to just be created. I remember not that long ago looking for teams for the wear team for Tombstone Tournament and struggling like hell to find anything closely resembling that. And you're, you're really limited with your options. And just a year later with printing, you could get 15 different werewolves. It's just, for a hobbyist, it's fantastic. For an artist, they can now make a model and sell it because people can actually use it. Because now people can print it at home. The whole production side has just handed it gone straight into the hands of the people at home, the consumers, and it's just enabled huge level of production. Now, granted, there are companies that rely on physical production and they can be hurt, like people who do traditional injection molding, like Games Workshop. But I think we've seen in the last few years that Games Workshop has grown massively. I'm not sure how big printing has really impacted them, just because they have their own niche. But companies that other companies, I think Grebo, you mentioned, Ben, as being a really good example of where it's, it's helped them. I mean, traditionally, they would cast in metal or resin. Instead, they've gone and got some not very nice 3D printers. I won't... I won't pretend to know if they cost more or less than their old methods, but that, like, in fact, you can, consumers can buy them probably is a good indication. Um, they can print now their stuff in better quality than they've got. I've got older Grebo stuff and the new Thunder Cougar Falcon beards, and the Falcon beards are just so much sharper in the new Greeblood, um, which is their 3D printed version. And they're one-piece molds. You don't have to faff around assembling, gap filling. I think it's it's only helping those manufacturers. And like you say, Ben, you're someone who owns a 3D printer and still you'd buy these models, even though it's just, you know, because it's just 
you don't have to deal with the hassle and you're directly supporting the company and i'm all on board for that like i own a printer i bought the thunder cougar falcon beards because i love Rebo and i want them to be able to do their thing also back punga because i want them to be able to do their thing i just think it's this is where it's turning into a rant because I am so passionate about this. I think <laughs> my, 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 my thing is just I, I, I think it's doing wonders for the hobby. Um, I think it gets a lot of negative rap, but I think it's really important to view it as on the side of the consumer. Um, Ian, don't mention Warhammer Plus, okay? Just he's on a roll. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get one in every podcast. <laughs> one rant for two minutes. No, no, no. That's really but important I, that you do. It, 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 yeah, and it's an important point because there's a lot of a lot of the fear about 3D printing is that it's going to kill traditional miniature uh, makers. I think it's going the other way. I think yeah. it's it genuinely there are more miniatures of a higher level of quality available exponentially this time this year to this time even eighteen months ago, let alone two years ago, and the, and the detail behind that and. It's it's not like I'm going to never buy a miniature again. Yeah, I was gonna say, mm. when I was the got... last time Games Workshop produced a team and you guys didn't buy it? Yeah. You know, and I, I've got boxes of of Games Workshop miniatures for various games in various states of built or unbuilt, but I've still bought them. Um, and it's not it's not I've not gone. I'm never going to buy a team again. I'm just. I'm printing the teams I, I want to, to print and play with. Um, and I, I don't, it's not a competitive thing, but it's genuinely brought more variety to it. And th to see some of the teams that come out, some, particularly for some of the star players or, or the big guys or the one-off characters, uh, it makes such a difference. I mean, I, my tree for the OWA, that's, there's, there's not a really good blood fantasy football tree miniature at the moment that we could find and we found one off uh my mini we found five off my mini yeah, factory and then had a bit of a <laughs> chat <laughs> and it looked great on the pitch it's it's amazing yeah, yeah. amazing when it's like painted it's, stuff can look inconsistent in models and then when it's all painted in the same scheme it just ties it all together it did I've, I've seen that happen so many times um I, yeah i think you're bang on their trips I, it's it is really good to see. We've seen these companies grow, and like you say, I'm also just I'm building a plastic sprue as we're speaking. So, like you say, so we haven't <laughs> really hasn't gone away. Um, I think we we mentioned this before, Ben. I remember something I think you said um, that stuck with me is it's really no different to kit bashing. It's just changing where the model is made to begin with. Like if you were good, if you were to buy like an old World War Two um, scale model tank and then stick gubbins and guns on it and turn it into like an orc like mega tank like i don't see that as much different as finding a really cool model someone's made online printing it yourself and then you know maybe bashing stuff onto that or just running it as it is because it's just so good out the box like proxies have been around in this hobby for ages ages and ages like ever since games exist suddenly there are proxies for them so I, I think sometimes that argument is blown a little bit out of proportion because it's the only real difference is that you now the people can print it at home rather than it being printed in a factory somewhere else. The funny thing, only really the difference. right? Think about this: we'll spend five pounds easy on a good STL, right? That's five pounds profit immediately to whoever the heck has sculpted that. If they were to sculpt exactly. that model, pay for the mold. We've done it, right? We we spent four hundred and eighty pounds getting a model sculpted, getting molds made get it actually manufactured and we ended up with like 25 pieces like yeah the, it, all you're doing is reducing the overhead so someone like you said ben someone can just go sculpt something really sweet and then it is almost all profit obviously there's a cut and etc etc because of you know how the world works but then, you know yeah. like you buying five pounds worth of stl from somebody is going to give them more money than if you had let them produce a model and then you know do it old school and when it comes to companies like punga who are tapping straight into the stl market or grebo and norba who have got printer farms of their own their profit margins going up their profit margins going up and that is great as well and they can do stuff with the the, STLs. like i was saying like this the new since grebo went into the, like, the high high quality resin printing i it, the products are better like i i love their old metal stuff but it, it is better I guess I just wanted to highlight 
through this episode is that actually printing is out there. It isn't easy, but it is not as hard as it used to be. Um, and it is not killing the marketplace. So I am 100% painting this hack phlegm and not painting a Games Workshop one. But that is not because I didn't want to buy the Games Workshop one. It's because... No, that's not fair. It's not because I wanted to save the money. It's just that I just don't like the hack phlegm from Games Workshop. Like, straight, yes. I, have no, I have no problem buying a... I bought, you know, old Golem Face, who is frustratingly 90% scale. That is a great argument for. I would print that at 120% and it would be brilliant. It's not 120%. Him and Skull, him and Skrull are just slightly smaller. And if that was an STL, we could just print it slightly bigger. Um, but I'm printing this because it's an alternative. If this had been available from Grebo, you know, or, or, or Punga, or whatever the heck else, if this was a D&D model, I would have gone and bought it. I printed it because I wanted this model. Like, the fact I had to print it, does, it you know, if this model had been in plastic, I would have bought it. I, it, it, it and that, for me, is the thing that is completely no different is Punga has got yeah. the same amount of profit um, and I've got the same model I would have run no matter who would made it because I'd prefer the model. And there are going to be some players out there that are like, oh yeah, I need a team so I managed to get these STLs together. It cost me £7 for the STLs and £4 to print. Boom, got a team in £11. And you know what? If that meant that they then have a team that they would not have otherwise, then that's flipping awesome. Like, because we're not, you know, if it is, oh man, I really want to run Necromantic, but I don't like the Games Workshop team, get a different team. Like, we've been doing that for years. Like, literally, Necromantic, people have been going and buying werewolves for years. Like, as a cracking example. Ogres, you know, like, oh, do I want a different ogre? It's, It's no different. Like, I'm really pleased because you guys are quite right. All it's doing is allowing people to be more creative, have a bit more, uh, flexibility, and with everything that's out there it's just it's just more of the same and i'm really pleased to say because this is something i didn't see myself getting into and then ben went and did it and then ian went and did it as well and i was like oh all right then you know uh something something for the podcast uh better take one for the team you know and it's been great <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been an great. investment in the podcast. and i think you know last year Year before last, I went through that thing where I made all those molds, the silicon molds of tiles for dungeons, mm. and I went through this plaster casting phase where I just... It's the same thing as Briz Printing. You're doing stuff. You're creating stuff. You're making time. Like, it, this is just better. Um, oh, I did love making that stuff, though. But man, man, I still get reminders every yeah. day at 7 o'clock from eBay saying, do you still want Plaster of Paris? Um, which really winds Tiff up because one day she was home and I forgot to tell her and 25 kilos turned up in this like one meter drum of plaster of Paris. So when I got home, I opened the door into it because it was too heavy for her to move. Uh, that is now resin, really. That's what happens with resin. Um, except Amazon Prime yeah. gets it here to me next day. Anyway, is, is there anything else you guys want to talk about when it comes to printing for Blood Bowl? Yeah, I'd say, I think so, so, kind of what you were saying there, Ben, I think some people... Um, some people can confuse it with recasting. That's that's different. Um, I think wherever you stand on recasting, you'll stand on printing something that's identical to something that already exists. Uh, I think that's a similar argument to be made. So I think a lot of... Uh, if, if perhaps you're thinking of that, where it's like, oh, it's it's theft or like copyright theft or something like that, I'd say it's, it's just as much as, as someone who makes one, you know, Sherman tank and then another company makes another Sherman tank or whatever. It, it's like... It's different models that are being made by different artists from scratch. So in those situations, it's a completely different argument. So I, I wouldn't confuse it with that because I have seen discussions online about people comparing it to recasting. In, I think it's a very just different argument. In that situation, it's exactly the same as buying third party. And I think that's yeah, exactly. where I've always stood. It's just that the costings and how you get it is very different. You know, it's yeah. it's like furniture, isn't it? Sometimes you just go to Ikea, but you've got to build it yourself. Uh, you know, it's it's IKEA's furniture. This guy, this is inspired by Games Workshop, but he is not does not look like the Games Workshop hack for them. That's why I'm using him. Um, you know, <laughs> and there are there are stuff there is stuff out there that is a carbon copy. Um, what is it? Heresy Forge, Heresy Miniatures. There's one that just Heresy Labs, Heresy Labs yeah. which is just like, hey, here's a copy of this 40k model, but we've made him slightly taller. 
that is potentially a grey area. But in Blood Bowl, yeah. it's just different stuff, isn't it? Like It's just like Ian said, I wanted a tree man. There were 75 to choose from. And, um, you know, that's awesome. Like, you were never going to buy two of the Games Workshop tree men because that's £50 to get the same model twice. Like, no one was going to do that. You would go to Warlord, buy the pack of three trees for £20 in postage, and call it quits. Like you would never... Unless you like the Games Workshop tree, of course. You know, there it are, is I'm a sure cool, there are people... It is a cool tree, <laughs> but I don't know. Like, you could do something different and... You know, when it comes to tree men, there's a billion out there. When it comes to minotaurs, there's almost as many, which I am a big, big fan of. Um, how about you, Trips? Anything more on the printing front? So I, I think the the one thing would be, and you, you touched on it earlier, is that it does go wrong, the printer. <laughs> uh, so we've all had the want to throw the printer at the wall moment. Um, when you can't figure out quite why it's gone wrong or you, you know exactly why it's gone wrong and you don't have that spare part to hand or it's dried or something like that. So it it's a hobby that does require a little bit of work um, to look after it and it will require a bit of repair, a bit of TLC, a bit of cleaning every once in a while. Um, and I think we all know that when you're having a bad day with a printer, the best thing to do is to go away and paint for a couple of days <laughs> yeah. rather than play with the printer any longer. It can sit and wait for a while. I've left mine in, with resin in it for six weeks and it was fine. I just literally I stirred it around and printed it and it came out fine. <laughs> so yeah, resin it can is sit in incredibly time. resilient, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. Actually, that does bring me on to my last point, which you've reminded me of, is I've had a pretty apocalyptic failure with my printer this week in that the resin film split on the bottom of the resin tank and then just poured liquid onto the light screen. And I'm, I'm like, this is so I went to, I had a failed print and I was like, fine, let's take the tray off. Let's find the pits that have fallen off and then the tray wouldn't come off. And I was like, oh, that's that's not good managed to get it off and it's just resin covered the whole thing but because it had covered the whole thing i managed to just flick up a corner and peel it off like pva on a child's hand and it just came away gave it a bit of a clean up <laughs> what when you were a kid did you when you were a kid did you never cover your hand with pva and peel it off no it's just the concept of you finding a child to peel pva off is horrific <laughs> 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 Or you could just pour <laughs> resin on your own light screen and it gives the same effect, but way more stressful, I imagine. Um, and uh, yeah, managed to peel it all off. Did, did get a print. One of the edges is raising and I'm assuming that's because I haven't leveled it or something. Uh, it could be that one of the edges of the screen is knackered. It could be a completely KO situation and that's okay because I've been a bit lackluster with it and these things just happen. But all I need to do then is get a new LED screen or... What's more likely is upgrade to uh, whatever printer Great Trips printer. has got. Yeah, exactly. Um, just because actually, where am I now? What month is this? This is month seven, eight, nine. Uh, so yeah, for fifteen pounds a month, this printer is is that's that would have been my investment at this point, and I have definitely got more than fifteen pounds a month worth of gear out of it. And when it comes to loss of earnings for shops for games and stuff, I don't think. You know, if you get a good release, you're going to buy it. Like, if the only way to get a model is to buy it from the shop, and the model's that good or the game's that good, you're still going to buy it. And that, for me, is is fantastic. I think it's just a win-win situation. But Triplo is a completely right. It is work. It is a it is a an airbrush kind of thing. You've got to maintain it. It is a it is a thing that you've got to work on, and it's rewarding though. It's good fun. Right, guys, let's take a very quick break. And as I'm painting hat for them, it seems appropriate we talk some more about star players. And we're back. So the second thing we're going to talk about today is the prevalence of star players. So going into 2020, all the star players basically got cheaper in monetary value for the game and they got a little bit more impressive. They all got special super secret magic powers that everyone forgets as well. And because of that, what we're seeing in a lot of tournaments is basically a ton of star players turning up and doing really, really well. And because of that, we're seeing a lot of comments like, are star players overrated? 
are we going to see tournaments ban them? Um, when it comes to league, I actually think it's not going to be a massive problem. The only teams that are likely to be able to have those stars very often are going to be the stunty teams and you're playing them for the lols anyway. It does mean that a halfling team in a league or an underworld, not underworld, but a snotling team in the league is always going to have access to things like Morg, Griff, Hack Flem. But that just really, I feel like, keeps them competitive. And one thing, of the one probably one of the biggest gripes of the old edition of Blood Bowl was that inducements just really didn't do enough. Now, if you're down three, four hundred k, you're going to get a star player who is going to do enough to keep you in the game, and that's all that matters. But star players in tournaments are popping up everywhere. There was one tournament that uh, I did see mentioned on the Blood Bowl community the other day. Top five teams: halflings, Chaos Dwarf, halfling, halfling, halfling. Be but that was natural. Really? Yeah, but that was because the tournament kind of favoured um, a big build allowance. So. It was like 1400k or something. So it was basically halflings cool. with Morgan Griff uh, times four. And even at Bonehead Bowl, we kept the value low because we wanted to give players an opportunity to play Blood Bowl as opposed to play anything too crazy, which is very unlike us. But hey, it's a new edition of Blood Bowl. But 1100k, we still saw some star players, uh, didn't we, Ian? Um, and oh, yeah. Yeah. And we saw some Hack Flems. We saw some Griffs. Ogres with Griffs did pretty well. Um, and it's it's a good balancing factor. So the question is, guys, and we'll start with you, Ian. Star players in this edition, you had a chance to play a tournament already. Have they been overpowered, or did they just make a game? It's, uh, so it might be a slightly controversial opinion with what's been going around the community lately, but I don't think star players have been overpowered. I think people didn't use them enough in the old version. Interesting. So previously, I've always used tournaments to run a star player, to try a star player. Um, I have notoriously taken Griff to the odd tournament, um, but also <laughs> played with a few others because it's been the opportunity to do it because you didn't really get that chance much in League. And they were really powerful just like they are really powerful now i think the difference is now that because they are slightly cheaper nearly everyone is getting them into a tournament build and you don't have to give up as much so i think one famous star player would probably be uh, roxana from the last meta which was roxana and amazons was pretty prevalent but you had to pay a lot. And Amazons were the only team that could really afford her because they are quite a cheap build. So at 1,200 or so, you could fit Roxy into an Amazon build and she brought a load of stuff that the team didn't have. But you'd hardly ever see a Griff because, you know, you had to give up a ton of it. I mean, Ian, you ran Griff and did pretty well at Beachhead last year. But fitting him into the build, you had to give up yeah, a load of stuff. Yeah, it was basically Griff and a team alignment. Yeah, you had like two blitzers, wasn't it? I think that's about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, two blitzers. I think I squeezed the thrower in just to squeeze the lead reroll because <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't have had a reroll. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. But this edition, it's it's way easier to afford stuff because they are cheaper. Um, uh, what have we got here? Uh, off to bed. Lennart's off. Catch you later. Tyler, finals match in LA tourney. Me, Lizards versus Pearls with Roxana. She was crazy. Nine plus dodges in a single turn. Leap, jump up, or two plus. Roxy is awesome, but she's still quite expensive. And she's limited to elf-only teams now. And elves are not cheap when it comes to positionals. But it's nice to see she can still do stuff. It's even nicer that we didn't know that already. So that she's not been used very much. But Roxy is a very powerful star player. So I guess... We're seeing a lot of people who used to play old tournaments worried because the game moved people's cheese anyway, didn't it? Like it's changed a lot of stuff about the game. It's reinvented it. It's it's a new edition, and a lot of it is for new players. You know, like these uh, referee rules that just dropped. They there was a set of referee rules very similar back in the, one of the compendiums in the nineties, but actually we're seeing it again now for this generation of Blood Bowl players which I think is fantastic to get that stuff out. But all those guys who played tournaments, we had a meta, star players were difficult to put in. Now we're seeing them, so we're seeing them used a lot, I think basically like Trip said, which is that they're just more affordable, so why would you not run them? And actually it gives you an opportunity to try them out, not in uh, a league meta. You know, 
it it does bring up the question of is this what blood bowl should be ben what do you think what you mean in terms of like restricting them to tournaments yeah if you're going to play a blood bowl tournament a tournament that is representing your team go along and competing in something should we see so many star players um well i'm kind of with trips i, I think this is the place for them i think it's like tournaments kind of represent the exhibition match um and that's kind of where you'd see like a star player i think them showing up in league is almost a little bit odd um because that's like such like a you know a league is is a league it's a, it's a small thing i i think i think it's good that we see more star players in tournaments i You've already said it before, a lot of them were too expensive before. Um, and now with the unique abilities, I think that really does shake things up. Um, you can kind of build... I, well, from what we've found with building our rosters for the tournament on Saturday, which requires a star player, it's been really interesting thinking about building a team to complement the star. And now that's possible, I think that's really kind of fun. And again, like Trip said, it's a really cool, unique way to play and build a roster rather than thinking just like, right, how much block can I squeeze in? Look at you, Milton. Um, be like, what kind of star can I squeeze in and how can I support that star? It feels very much like uh, like deck building in, um, in CCGs. And I wonder if there's an element of that which also feels uncomfortable. So Games Workshop with Warhammer Fantasy Battle back in the day had some special characters but they were not omnipresent. Like, you didn't always see the same guys. Like, occasionally you saw Tyrion because he was awesome, but it didn't come up that often. Then Age of Sigmar landed, and basically every army has to run special characters because they are just so good. Blood Bowl, there yeah. are definitely some vibes that it is also moving that way when it comes to the competitive scene. And... You know, like, actually, which build is it? Is it the, this build? Is it the Hackflam build? Is it the... Yes, it's always the Hackflam build. Uh, and that's not just because I'm painting it, although I will say I'm running Snotlings, so, you know, give me a break. But, you know, there's... <laughs> <laughs> it's... I, I don't know, like... I, I get that it's different, and I get that we're seeing stars, but from running Bonehead Bowl and, and seeing all, you know, what, 30 matches, we had two Hackflams, we had a couple of Griffs and stuff, there was no, like, none of it was broken. And there is definitely this vibe that tournament results are showing that star players are broken. But no one in that tournament came away and was like, oh, it was just a joke. I couldn't do anything because of this person. Like, this star player is just that was outrageous. That There is a couple of gripes that I think are legitimate. And when it comes to Hackflem and his auto pick up the ball ability, that one might be a bit of a concern. Um, because he can just start his activation next to someone with the ball and just automatically take the ball. And that is the only thing that can do that in the entire game. And there is definitely an element where actually that in itself might be a bit too good, especially for a star player that is a little bit more expensive than a Rat Ogre. So it's like, do I want a Rat Ogre or do I want an Edge 9 move, uh, an Edge 4, Edge 2 plus? I did a bunch of... Um, special team Sundays today so I've like bounced back into old blah blah uh, but you know like it's interesting I don't think it's that much of a go for it I think what you were saying there though sums up a lot of the gripes I have with the stars where we've been talking about Hackflem and Griff there are a lot of stars here that you just don't want and like in the last episode we had we did our tier list there was I think three that shared the S tier. And when you have these keywords, which are pretty slim in terms of like, they cover quite, you know, there's not many of them. And so they cover quite a lot of teams and you get people like Griff who can play for, you know, a lot of teams with the old world classic and halfling thimble cup. It's just like, it seems a bit of a shame that, there's that much power disparity between them. So where we're saying building a list is really fun, it's fun for like the three star players that you'd kind of want to use. Otherwise, you're just kind of arming your own list <laughs> for no reason. I see. I see. I'm going to have to disagree with you then, Ben, because so I ran halflings at Bonehead Bowl. So I had Carla and Rumbelow in 
and it could have been a deep root build it could have been a, a different variety those those two styles worked really well i think looking at a number of the stars like the, the, there are a few pretty crap stars who you will see people only take when they either didn't realize or they are literally doing it for the lols but a lot of them are really situational of how you then build the rest of the team around them and mm. A lot of people, I mean, it depends who you play with, but a lot of people we play with will not go with the, I will take the standard build because I know that one's going to be the best for rolling the dice. There's a lot more, I'm going to play with this because it's different, or I'm going to give it a go, or this is going to be a bit of fun. That basically sums up yeah. scroll, doesn't it? Like there, there's a lot of people who are brewing up wicked scroll lists because they want to just deep ball the bomb. At deep bomb the ball, just wants to a werewolf on their team, and that's just what they're building their team to do. And I think that is very, very cool. But I mean, you're both right essentially. But when it comes to Blood Bowl, there is a bunch of teams that just run the teams because they want to have fun. Um, like that's what half the Blood Bowl rosters are. And then there's Nurgle, which is just for people who've lost bets. Um, bless them. Uh, although they can run Hackflem, so maybe a Nurgle build with Hackflem. I think it's just difficult. I mean, yeah, we talked about it to death last week um, on the, the tiers and things because some star players just bring stuff to teams that they don't have. So Griff is a great one that go on like Ogres or Halflings and stuff because he brings edge and strength and quality to a team that otherwise really doesn't have any. And it's um, and, it, and Hackflem being able to boost up teams that don't have scoring threats and agility. That they add things that they're missing and that's what makes them so powerful but ultimately i think in those situations it's an equalizer got some great points in chat here uh this is from ross saying uh tournaments they are awesome in since you don't have to worry about losing any spp that should go to a player you need to level which is a really good point you're buying a preset bunch of skills now we talk about this when you're building a roster because actually um spending an extra 20k to take a thrower instead of a lineman is almost always a great idea because there's generally speaking no trade-off you just get free rolled some skills star players are exactly the same way this is why i'm so disappointed that i'm not seeing grack everywhere is because it's a sure hand star player along with an ogre like it's just perfect i think he might just be a little bit too pricey because a little bit more and you can get griff a little bit less and you can get hack phlegm um bit of a shame i think at some point that'll swing back round and everyone will be like oh actually grack is great Grack is a great crack here because it can do a bunch of stuff that is technically subpar. Um, but yeah, Ross, great point that. Tyler, the reason I think stars are good in the meta is you get to run skills that aren't tier 1 or added tier 2 skills that you wouldn't normally take. It's nice. That's really fair as well, actually. Uh, yep. I think, what, Griff got Fend, Ian? It, yep. Yeah, Fend, which... Well, Fend as well. Yeah, it's everything, doesn't it? Exactly. Grow is yeah. just griff, isn't it? Um, and liminality. Uh, does the prevalence of the meta star players open up an interesting design space for Games Workshop to make anti-star player figures? Does that clutter up Blood Bowl too much? I love where liminality is going with this one. Anti-star players. You mean dwarf teams? Um, but no, liminality is exactly right. And I think the ultimate anti-star player is a star player who already exists which is uh, Werewolf Boy, who is Strength 4 Frenzy Chaney. Wrestle. Yeah. Like, yeah. Chaney is the best safety in the game, but he's also a Movement 8 scoring threat. But uh, something to counter star players if you want to spend TV on it would be pretty clever. Um, but I, I think I unreservedly like it right now. I think it could get wearing... But right now, we've gone from having 29 teams to, I don't know, probably, let's say there's four good star player builds per team. All right, so we've got like 120, 100 plus different rosters. We've got Hack Flem Underworld, but there's also the Grack Hunt. There's also, there's just, there's builds there. There's more builds. And that makes, in theory, more variety. However, you know, we're only really a month into tournament season. In another six months, if everyone is running Hackflem all the time and it's full of Hackflem Underworld and uh, Morg or Griff, you know, halflings, on the one hand, it's going to be very much like, uh bored of seeing the same lists. But someone did mention online, which I thought was a really brilliant point, was, dude, is that not the same as always seeing Wood Elves and Dark Elves in the top five? 
Uh, sort of, yeah, yeah, sort of. It was like less like because that's a team. It feels like it's less like one thing doing it. Um, it's like I don't know, taking hack flem. It just makes it sound like you can just take it and win. If that makes sense, I I, I don't know. It's hard to say. I feel there's more counters to a wood elf team than there is against like a single star. Um, I think Ross's yeah. point is an interesting one as well because we're coming at it from the lens of seeing them in tournaments at the moment, and so in tournaments you're seeing lots of. 110, 120 TV teams with star players in. Star players as inducements in leagues does change the dynamics because Hackflem isn't going to be a great star player to take when you're down that much because he's just going to suck up all your SPP and he's going to give your team nothing at the end of it other than maybe a victory that yeah an extra 10k you, from an extra touchdown yeah an extra 10k from some touchdowns and details you're still going to be short of that much so are you going to look to take a different star player to be that player on the line to help protect your two positionals who you're desperately trying to skill up or all that detail and i think that use of star players for league is a very different way of doing it but most of us are at two or three league games tops. We're a long way away from being able to generate a, a an inducement cap to get a star I, player into a build yet. I agree. I think the issue with it, though, is in league, you have so many choices of inducements as well. Sometimes a star isn't going to be what you want. But maybe that what will help you win the game will be, you know, the extra reroll or a wizard or, you know, other things which you can induce. Um well, you have they're, they're competing for a lot. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's all. I mean, we've had that comparison before. Would you rather have this star or a wizard? And sometimes it's sometimes better to take a cheaper star and a wizard. Although we, we've lost access to a lot of those really cheap ones, you know, like the ATK ones. Um, I, think, make on. I think the biggest thing here is that although exhibition matches are now in the rule book, um, Blood Bowl is a game that's designed for League. Um, you know, and and it's really quite interesting because this, in some ways, is a lot like uh, it's a lot like arguing about the right things to do if you were playing a competitive game of Dungeons and Dragons, like <laughs> like the experience, the experience system, and what Games Workshop build. They build a narrative game that is brewed up and built specifically for League. So these star players you know aren't designed for competitive play not really like they they know that competitive play exists but they don't care like competitive play in blood bowl is something that we build as a community because we want to play competitively with resurrection format you know you guys are both right like when it comes to league you're not trying to win that game you are trying to keep your team alive so that you can win the next two games like you are playing the strategy game not just you know this is about the war not the battle or in tournament it's just three battles go i don't care who dies let's let's win like we're all playing general pattern here with zombies yeah <laughs> oh man zombie tanks why is that not in a game um that's a really good point um not the zombie tanks although that is also a really good point that's a pretty good um, point <laughs> where you're saying about the community and what you were saying before if blood bowl Competitive Blood Bowl is a community thing, and like we've seen this with the NAF for a long time, which kind of managed community Blood Bowl. It is. It's NAF tournament at the weekend. Um, could we not have a rotation of stars? Would that help solve the problem? You have a rotation. So in this season, you can pick from this pool of stars. Um, then every six months, or maybe less than that, it depends how, how things, maybe every quarter, um the rotation switches up suddenly these stars are moving out and new ones are moving in it's kind of ones for everyone they could maybe introduce new stars for a rotation and then they rotate out kind of like you know keeping it alive how, how do you feel about that what do you think trips i've got some naff insights but i want to hear trips opinion first um so i think if if blood bowl was played by more people and had a sort of competitive sort of scene then seasonal play or rotation of stars would work i think because there's a lot of more fun i think you get much more into the general's handbook type of mm -hmm. place of going i need another book to play it for this year to know who's in who's out uh, and the detail there and then that clash between league and tournaments is going to really come up of 
if you're running a league that takes six months to run and it crosses over from seasons, what what do you do for inducements and stars as you go through it? I think the beauty of here's, here's your teams and your stars is that it's complicated enough because it's in five books, but simple enough because it's, it's not it's an only ever changing. In five books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an ever changing set of rules it's an ever tweaking set of rules so i love well, I this mean, idea ben um oh yeah Sorry, ben. i love this idea we talked about this with teams before haven't we um you know about about rotation and things like that ian is right when it comes to blood bowl blood bowl is more of a casual format kind of game and actually yeah. barrier for interest has got to be low. when it comes to the naf though uh there's been a lot of questions about like can we ban some star players like can we make sure that no one can run hack flim and actually, the answer is no, because uh, the NAF, um, one of the things they do that I don't think people realize is that they, they their, their purpose is basically just to try and preserve the peace. Um, they are all about homeostasis, as you guys will know from, from what we've seen in the past. But the reason for that is because they want to represent Blood Bowl itself as presented by Games Workshop for the most part as you know the game so you can't ban some players what you can do and this is something that we are seeing in some tournaments uh definitely not the one we're going to on saturday ben but we're seeing uh the highlander rule which oh gosh i, I think it's chaos cup is running this year so if uh trips you and i both run griff neither of us run griff you know uh which is a rule from the olden days which is if you both take a star, you both booked him, basically. And uh, he doesn't really, he can't decide who to play, so you both don't get to run him. Which would definitely, I think, do I want to run Hack Flem if I think everybody's going to run Hack Flem? Uh, then you end up playing a team without Hack Flem. I think that's quite an interesting way of doing it. Or you can just ban star players, um, which I think we might see if this format continues. There's a lot of tournaments that used to ban star players, except for Tier 3 anyway. Um, just out of fear and that kind of stuff you didn't really hear about because it didn't really cause much of an issue um liminality the dwarves are his main team so yeah definitely there um great lake says most of the stars are not out in this edition yet looking back older editions had tons of stars and meta can change with a spike yes i hope that we get stuff very similar to what liminality was saying maybe some anti-star you know tech or something like that but then you start creating this moving meta which can be quite difficult now right now the meta is can i get hack flem why do i want hack flem because he does stuff the rest of my team doesn't do all right that's cool that's as it goes but you're still playing blood bowl you know it, it doesn't matter like okay you've got hack flem but if hack flem dies with a cheeky two die tackle block you know that's it and it's just one guy sure he can sure he's broken sure roxanne is broken but they're just really good star players um in a game that's designed to be narrative and with a view of league so what trips was saying about actually it's a great way to play with star players because you may get to use one once per season and you need to determine whether or not actually griff is going to do more now than actually an apothecary extra reroll and a keg so that i can keep my team fighting and a lot of the time He's not going to be better than that because you want your team to develop. And it's really interesting. I think I think when it comes to stars, like that's the battle. And when it comes to TOs deciding what they want to run, allowing stars, not allowing stars, you know, it's all or nothing. Um, and I think for now, they'll leave it open because, uh, well, we saw Wayne 3-0 with Underworld, but one of them was a very close game and i'm very certain that all three of those games were a lot more about wayne than they were about hack um you know <laughs> and that's what we want to see you know you guys both played three games and there were some stars mixed in there and i genuinely of the 20 guys who were there nobody was like man i had no chance because of hack Flem. it was whew, he outplayed me like those it was more about the snotlings than it was about the stars which is definitely why i'm taking snotlings uh yeah, yeah, and uh, I've just agraxed Hack Flam, and I think it was a mistake. He looks a bit dark now, but that's fine. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, for both of you, if you went to a tournament that was saying no stars at all, what would that mean to you? I mean, Ian, this is probably more of a you question than a Ben question because he's just going to go corn. But yeah, um, yeah. blood dive. <laughs> Well, if you're banning stars, you got to ban, ban the Bloodthirster as well, because it is not <laughs> the best built-in star, having seen that Terra-sider team. I, 
I don't. I, I wouldn't have a problem if the tournament banned the stars because I think I think the biggest thing about tournaments is it's for the TA to decide what kind of setup and rules you want to build, and it's not like playing Blood Bowl without a star for a day is going to be not fun. There are twenty nine teams and a variety of roster builds. See Ben's videos um, <laughs> to 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 um play and th there's always going to be a team that you've either really want to play or haven't played for a while i don't know i'd love i'd love to to turn up to a tournament with no stars and i'll take a milton all block orc build and see if i can really crush some skulls all day with it that's fair what about you bt I I wouldn't mind. I'm I I it wouldn't really affect me too much. This is the first time I'm taking a star in a tournament on Saturday, so it really hasn't doesn't affect me too much. I I am trying to think if I've ever used one in a tournament. I've definitely used them in league. I use it in tournament. No, no, I've used fungus the loon in a goblin team before in a tournament. Um and the chainsaw one. Yeah, so I have used them before, but it wouldn't it wouldn't really bother me too much. Uh, I I think the game's more about the team than the star, in my opinion. But I don't think it has to be. I think it, it could be um, definitely branched out further and see more of them. Yeah, I mean, I I think more Blood Bowl is more better. So when it comes to the stars, having those builds, I think is pretty cool. Uh, I do think that if they become a problem, if they do start to dominate the meta after six months, we'll see more Highlander. Or one off, and you know what? That wouldn't massively affect my decision to go to a tournament or to play in a tournament. It would definitely affect my decision to play, but at the moment, my biggest decision to play is what the skills are allowed, whether it's SPP by, whether it's TV by, or whether it's just a set skill set. That is for me the biggest driver of what team I choose for an event, um, not whether or not I can take a star. And uh, I think we will probably see a, a lot of tournaments go. Ooh, I've seen on Facebook that stars are terrifying. Let's ban them. But ultimately, you're still going to be having a fun game of Blood Bowl and you're just choosing your meta at that point. You're the DM. You are setting the story. Like, are we playing this in the Firefly universe? Is this the Star Wars universe? Like, what do the spaceships do in this zone? And what are we playing? And if those are the two different types of Blood Bowl, well, that's great, right? I think that's... I think that's cool. You get to choose what you want. If it's a star player event that we're going to on Saturday where you have to take one star player, well, then actually we're all geared up to play Hero Hammer on the Blood Bowl pitch. Uh, but if the next tournament is 1100 TV with uh, skill buy, well, then no one's taking stars at that point because they're going to want to spend that 1100 on Amazons taking block uh, or dwarves taking a cheeky bit of guard. And that's the other type of Blood Bowl. And it's still Blood Bowl. But I do like open events where you can have both because we saw this at Bonehead Bowl. And I do like, I think we probably could have squeaked out some extra skills. But again, we said we didn't want to flood it. Um, it would have allowed a bit more cool builds. But actually, we saw a bunch of teams that ran the teams and we saw a bunch of teams that ran the stars. And that made a really interesting mix. You know, we had the Underworld Hackflem build and we had the couple of corn with nothing on, right? Naked corn versus Hackflem Underworld. And it was a game of Blood Bowl and it was a close game of Blood Bowl, you know, and, and you know, it was perfect for me. I think that's that's absolutely great for the game. And, you know, not changing up the meta too much is potentially really good for players who are coming to tournaments for the first time. And I think that's something we've got to consider now is that a lot of the players that are going to tournaments right now are going to be going to their first tournament, are going to be playing their fifth or sixth game of Blood Bowl 2020. Like Bonehead Bowl, half those guys, veterans, right? None of them have played more than five games of BB 2020 on the tabletop, really. And, you know, we're going to have to uh, to go through that, and that is okay. And, I, you know, if we start seeing stars dominate, Highland is probably going to clear it up. Um, but we're going to see more stars, and that's going to be really exciting. But there are ways to mitigate it. A um, couple of things in the chat. Hurley Boy, are there any star players you would say are auto wins, or is it still down to the coach to be able to play them correctly? Guys, did you both play against Hackflem in the tournament? Yeah, I okay. did. I Hackflem barely did anything in the game for me. Uh, trips. I played against him 
and he uh, he did a really good b- job of sacking the ball carrier, killing himself trying to dodge to pick up the ball. So <laughs> I was quite happy overall with his uh, play. That was Julian, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, bless him. Uh, same model, actually. So, yeah, I, I don't think there are auto. I think there's just different builds. And I think the greatest example of this was Joe Solo's Kemri build which was didn't take two Tomb Guardians, so took two instead of four, but ran Wilhelm Cheney as well. And that just created a different roster. I mean, bless him, you ended up going one and two, but that first game, I thought, oh, we've got we've got a roster here that we've not seen before, and, and Cheney's allowing him to do some stuff. And then he just got diced out because Joe Solo should always be playing stunty. Um, everybody knows that. So uh, that, that one's on Joe. Uh, but yeah, it's a great one. And Liminality said not banned, just time off due to injury uh, for Stars. You know, I think that's what you were saying, Ben, about, you know, having a season where a star is unavailable personally, what I'd like to see. And I think this goes back to what we talked about before with seasons, Ben, is um, adjusted costs um, for stuff like some teams get more gold than others, i.e. tier systems. uh, And some star players cost more or less than they do, like an availability charge, you know, something like that would be fine. But I think that would jeopardize the NAF. Uh, rankings element of it which is very important to some people and fair enough you know it's, it's another element of the, you know it's the printing of competitive blood bowl you know it's that hobby um groovy right guys when it comes to star players is there anything else you think we need to touch on yeah it covers it for me yeah no i think it covers it for me i think i think we, we need to give it some more time Hey guys, Ben here. Sorry about all the tech issues. It is insanely hot in the studio and I think um, we might have had a couple of power cut issues due to the heat. I mean, my iPhone died, so it makes sense that everything else did. Anyway, thank you to everybody who joined us for the live chat. We'll probably do it again every episode because it's really good fun to do unless we're limited by time. And um, everybody else, thank you ever so much for listening. It's great to have you on board. Do let us know what your thoughts are. Jump in the Discord, have a chat with us or put in the comment below because... 3D printing and star players are actually really, really potent topics at the moment, and we want to know what you guys are thinking. Anyway, I'm going to go and make sure I can scrounge together enough of this episode to edit it and get it out, and uh, hopefully cool down a bit. Anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching and listening. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon.